There is a lot more to Jason's schema, um, just the spec itself we could talk about. But what I want to do is move on and show you very quickly how to get up and running with it. And then I want to take about 10, 15 minutes to go through some of the bumps and bruises I've had during the first 18 months to hopefully save you some pain if this interests you, okay? So first of all, from PHP. Just in Rainbow's package is the one to use. The README has all the example code you need to get started, so I'm not gonna put that in these slides. But that, that is the package, except no substitute on this one. Um, normally I'm all for multiple packages, competition, and all the rest of it. Having looked through the others, no. Not, not in this case. None of the others are I would use on a production system at all. Because actually that's because it's not like widely used, that's the reason why. Um, people are just like how to quit bashing it and just see if it's make bad things. Part of it, but part of the problem as well is a lot of the other packages, what they do is they add additional features that aren't in the spec because it makes life easier, especially when you're first starting and you're trying to get your head around JSON schema and you end up overcomplicating things. And there's, that's, the right, that's the right sentiment, overcomplicating it. And if you t use those features, you can't share the schemas with other languages, which for me is, a, is an absolute no-no. Um, because I can't remember the last time I worked on a project, that, uh, a PHP project, that didn't also have JavaScript somewhere in it. Can't remember that time. Um, I can remember using JavaScript before I ever used PHP, so being able to share between the two languages for me is an absolute must have. So these other packages, what they do is they go well beyond the spec and add convenience features. I mean, they mean well, don't get me wrong. They're not, they're not doing it because they think the spec is rubbish. They're just trying to solve their problems in that way but I advise against it. By doing that, you're starting to get into a situation where you're locked into one package, and if and when that package disappears, and I've got a slide on that a bit later on, you're then completely stuck. So if you want to use JSON schema, stick to the spec. Don't go beyond the spec. Now, from JavaScript, and I haven't looked up the TypeScript converters, but I use AJV's package for JavaScript. Um, this, again, is the one in JavaScript land, I would argue. Um, for a start, it's by far the fastest. It's got a 100% pass rate on the official specs and test cases. I'm not going to claim for a minute those test cases are good enough, but it's a start. Um, and I've, had a, I've been using this in anger in production systems and had no issues with it whatsoever. I'm very happy with it. It's got a huge community around it. Um, I think when you're dealing with things that are implementing a spec, there's safety in numbers and safety in communities rather than going it alone. So I would strongly recommend this. And again, the README for this package has all the example code you need to get started. So once again, there's no point in me reproducing that here. You can go and get that from the package. That's almost it for using it. There is one thing, which is the point you made earlier about how do we load schemas, which we'll come to in a moment. Are there any more questions about using them before I go on to the lessons I've learned the hard way? It's probably a bit out of the validation state of things. Oh, right. but have you seen examples of where people are using JSON schemas to build UIs as well? No, I haven't. So I've seen, I, I did a little bit of I have before, and um, there's, I've seen a couple that are like, they take JSON schema yeah. and associated, and they'll render components as say, if you've got some page application. I haven't seen anything quite like that. The closest I've seen is what is now called the Open API spec, it used to be called Swagger. And that uses something that's like JSON schema, but I believe isn't actually JSON schema. It isn't 100% compatible with the spec. I don't know the differences. I don't know if they're small, I don't know if they're big, but I'm told there are differences. And I believe the Swagger tools can actually take these specs and generate documentation, or at least skeleton documentation from them. Um, but I'm told they're not 100% compatible with the actual JSON spec. I think it's, it's, it's quite an interesting kind of concept, because if, yes. if, you, if you are quite heavy on 
um, you know, front end development and you you know, you need to focus on some of the more like fancy parts of it, building your eyes is kind of the thing like that. Whereas like if like you're building Jason C anyway, yeah, you might could potentially use that to build a right and override it if it's a bit like I suspect from the very limited front-end work I've done is what would happen in practice is your front-end app, there wouldn't be a one-to-one -one relationship between API calls and the screen itself. There'd be some elements, uh, for example, yeah, the whole contents of a single card on a, on a UI may be populated by an API call, for example. You might not get everything. So you may find there's people aren't doing it much of it. Be, um, I mean, maybe they are and I don't know about it. But if they're not, it may be because that relationship is just not strong enough. But go have a look and let us know. Yeah. If you find some great tools, let us all know. We'll all be grateful. Anything that saves time. I mean, that's, that's why I went down this route, is to save time. So anything we can use to reuse this to save even more time sounds fantastic. Any more questions from anyone? No? Nope. OK. So just to conclude, I want to share some lessons that I learned the hard way while using JSON Schema. Um, just to put it in context, I've used it on three projects, three systems now. So I've written about 40, maybe 50 schemas. I haven't kept account. Most of them are very simple schemas. I haven't needed to write complicated schemas. The, some of them are large because the APIs are rich in the data they accept, and they have a lot of API endpoints, but the schemas themselves are still very simple. So let's talk about JSON. What's everyone's pet hate about JSON? <laughs> if you had to pick one, well, okay, what's the first one that comes to mind then? You all like JSON, that's fantastic. I don't like double quotes. You don't like double quotes? Mm. Okay. Don't like the way you can't tell what type something is unless you have a schema to start with. It's okay. Just because it's kind of weird for this. But yeah. You can't reverse engineer phrase. You can't reverse engineer, that's very true. I mentioned earlier about going into that Google group where the spec is discussed. And this is the one that keeps cropping up in there, is the fact that you can't put comments in JSON. Um, you look at any DevOps tool that uses YAML, and the number one reason for using YAML over JSON is the fact you can put comments in there. Yeah? I do like YAML. Chris. <laughs> I, I don't know why I, I like YAML. I used to hate it, and now I like it. <laughs> Can you not Shall I go? Shall I? <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, now I need to add a talk to the list of homeless talks about why you should never use YAML. <laughs> <laughs> if you're desperate to have comments, can you just define a comments field? You can go better than that. The spec has evolved and they've introduced this concept called annotation keywords. So you've got validation keywords and they've also got annotation keywords. Where we've got specific fields that you can put information into. And I imagine they're going to add a few more as time goes on. Although there is a generic, I think it's called dollar comment. Um, there is a generic one as well. There's actually an advantage to the spec supporting these annotations rather than they're just being free-forming comments. Is once it all settles down, that means all these annotations will be machine readable, which will help with more tooling that consumes these specs and does things with them, like what you've been talking about, for example. So although it's painful on a day-to-day -day basis, there may be a long-term benefit out of it one day. Maybe. No promises. So that's, that's the main thing with JSON. JSON schema itself, I have to stress this enough if you're going to adopt it, you are not getting a finished article by any means, and you are not getting an article that is fixed in stone. Draft 7, or 07 to be more accurate, is the current draft there will be more. There's they're already working on draft eight, and in a moment I'm going to talk about why I think there'll be more than draft eight as well. It's six years old already. They have commitment issues? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know the backgrounds of the people writing this. 
so I don't know how much experience they have in API design. And also you've got all these people piling in who are adopting this technology and then going, we can't retrofit it to our existing systems. And that is driving the spec as well. But the basics, the stuff I've been showing you tonight, that feels like it's stabilized. I started with draft four 18 months ago. Um, when it came to move to draft seven, I don't even remember what I had to change to get my schemas working with draft seven. It was so small because I write these very simple style schemas. I can't even tell you what I did. I don't even remember it taking any effort at all. Um, I imagine there are people out there for whom it was a nightmare, but the simple stuff, the basics, they, they're not really changing at all. Now, where the spec is changing, one of it's annot the annotation stuff, but the main thing is people want to treat these as objects and they want inheritance in schemas. Because we've got, via dollar ref, we've got aggregation, which as OO developers we all believe is far safer in the long run. But there are people out there who say, no, we need inheritance in order to model our APIs um, reliably. Um, I'm not saying they're wrong. It's, but this is, this is, these are the areas where the draft is still feels experimental. It feels like they're exploring patterns, putting it out there for people to implement, people to adopt, and people to come back and say, it still doesn't solve my problem. Because some of these problems, they can't just be solved on a whiteboard. Sometimes you've got to actually tr have code you can run to try and fail with. And that's why I think it's gonna, there's going to be at least a draft nine as well, maybe even a draft 10 because these are difficult problems and getting people to agree on a solution I think will also be a challenge as well looking at the discussions in the groups. Um, another thing to note, it's not just that it isn't stable, but not all drafts that have been released have worked. Draft five was a complete dead end to the point is when draft six came out, they actually, if memory serves, the official advice was throw away your implementations of draft five, keep draft four, but anyone who's adopted draft five, tough. It's so bad we're throwing, we're, we're going to pretend it never happened. Sounds like PHP 6. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. The other thing, is, of course, is because we've got a draft that is moving, that means these packages that we want to use also have to keep up. And not all of them have managed to. And at least one high profile package, which I will not mention by name on the camera, after making a song and dance about how brilliant they were, had then gone up in smoke and disappeared because um, it was too difficult for them or they didn't have enough time to support the extra things that came along in later drafts. So that's another reason I've recommended those two particular packages which have got large communities around them and dedicated maintainers with a long track record. You're less likely to have to rip those out and replace them down the road. There are no guarantees and there can't be of course unless it's your code and you're maintaining it. But be careful of other packages that spring up and then because the risk of disappearing is quite good. Now fortunately, if you're just sticking to the spec itself, it's not too painful to replace one with another. Um, that's another reason to avoid getting into all these extra features because with the spec moving, these packages don't keep up. Sooner or later, you're gonna have a problem. All right? So, dollar ref resolving, your point from earlier. This is another thing that in documentation, in tutorials, is barely mentioned. It's the mechanism, the mechanism of how a ref and an ID works is explained, in, but very quickly in paragraph or two, and then everyone moves on. If you want to reuse your schemas, this is the headache. I mentioned this earlier, is the validators know these are IDs, they're not locators, so that they shouldn't be trying to ever load a file from that location. Some of them do, but if those that do are, are broken, they're not compliant with the spec. Spec says they shouldn't even try. So it's important that when you're picking a validator package, that validator package has a mechanism for you to tell it how to go and get the specs. It needs to delegate that back to you in one form or another. Not every package does. That's something else to watch out for. There's at least one PHP package out there that's been quite highly, rec highly recommended at the minute that doesn't, as far as I can tell, support this delegation mechanism at all. It just expects that to be a real URL and tries to load it. So I don't know how you'd use that in reality. 
Um, so be careful with that. It does mean if you want to use schemas in multiple files, you're going to have to know in advance you're doing that and make sure you load them into the validator or you've got your delegation method that when it gets the ID, it's got, it knows where, how to turn that ID into a file to load up. It does mean you've got, to, you've got to be on top of that game. But once you do it, you get used to it very easily. Regexes, something else you mentioned earlier, I believe. So we we'll go back to our record for a moment. I want to pick the string, because we haven't talked about strings much. And to validate a string, you do indeed use a regex, and the constraint's called pattern. OK? Just going to highlight that a little bit more there. I, I haven't got this explicitly mentioned on the slides, but I do want to point out the regex has to be anchored at both ends. Um, you, the spec is very clear. But again, it's like one throwaway sentence um, that's easy to miss. Is you can't assume the strings are anchored. If you write a regex, um, it will match in the middle of words as well. You've got to be careful with it. Now the spec says that all the regex should, and, and they, use, they use the word should, not must. They should be ECMA 262 compliant. Specifically, a third edition, I believe. I don't read a lot of ECMA stuff, so I'm not really up on it. But here's the thing. Who the hell uses ECMA stuff outside JavaScript? Yeah? We're lucky in PHP. We've, we've got the industry standard regex implementation, which is PCRE. It's the oldest. It's the most mature. It's the industry. It's the de facto industry standard. Do all JavaScript implementations have ECMA 262 compliant regex stuff? You'd hope so, but this, there are several JavaScript engines at the end of the day, especially when you're starting to run schemas in browsers. They're not all running V8. So there may be differences between JavaScript implementations. Don't take it for granted that there aren't. And I'm not a Java developer anymore, and I've never been a .NET developer, so I don't know much about their regexes and how close they are to ECMA 262 or PCRE or any other thing, or if they go off the reservation. There is a Wikipedia page which tries to compare, I think it's about a dozen different uh, regex engines. And it's, uh, there was no point in me even attempting to fit it on this screen. It just scrolls on for pages and pages of all the different features. Uh, PCR, I'm pleased to say PCRE comes out really well in the comparisons. But there are differences. And if you want to use schemas in JavaScript and in PHP and any other languages, Make sure your regexes are simple. And if they're simple, hopefully they'll work everywhere. If you need to use complex regexes, and I suspect the email regex may be one of those. I, I found a tutorial and it said it has a, like, I guess, a special rule. So it uses string and then it says format email. Right. As if it's like a defined okay. system knowledge. Right. OK. I have to be honest and say, when I was reading draft 7 spec, I didn't see the format field there. I believe it used to be, but I didn't spot it in draft 7. Is it, have you got draft 7 there right now? Uh, is that what you're looking at? Or is no, it I'm tutorial? just on a Toots Plus tutorial. Okay. okay. It's worth checking. 2016. It's worth checking the spec to see if it's in the spec and I've missed it. It's worth checking that. Because you may have, yeah, I may have missed it. I've got two points, more points I want to make. The first one is we are not doing correctness validation. This is one of the areas where people are trying too hard with uh, JSON Schema. And he, JSON Schema actually supports if then else, by the way, um, in order to actually have logic in your schema, which I don't use at all. So I can't talk about how that works. But what we're doing here, oh, I'll, I'll explain. I'll, let me focus on the groups and explain what we're doing. So groups is an array of group IDs, OK? Very simple, and they're all integers. And so we can write, we can easily write a schema for that. Although you haven't seen the constraints for an array before, there's nothing there you can't go and look up and instantly drop in. OK, it's they're different words, but it's all, the, it's all the same stuff we've all used. It's all the same simplicity. And what we're doing is we're saying it contains um, a, a list of GIDs, and I've made GIDs and ADIS for UIDs 
rather than redefine them because the same rules pretty much work for both. But what does that schema actually do? What is it achieving? What does it tell you about that data? It's telling you the acceptable ranges. It's telling you acceptable ranges, that's correct. It's telling you anything else? It's not empty. It's not empty. It's telling you that the array is not empty, that's correct. That's a very good point. Is it telling you anything else about those, those ent entries in that array? It's not telling you anything else. If we look at it, all it's doing is telling you that the groups is an array and it contains an array of integers that fall within those two ranges. And there's going to be at least one of them. That's all it's telling you. So it's telling you they're formatted as group IDs. That's why on the diagram at the front, I said we format validation, first of all. It's not telling you anything else. So for example, it's not telling you that those numbers mean a damn thing to the system that's receiving them. Yeah, they may not exist. They may, you, there's nothing to say that that user's allowed to be in any of those groups, okay? It's not fall into verification. Exactly. That's all business logic. And that should stay in your business logic. You need, to, you need to do this as a layered approach to get the best out of JSON schema, not trying to cram too much into it, and also not end up with holes and, and gaps in your app. Yeah, you just validated that someone sent you a request that makes sense. Yes. Not that it's valid in terms of... Exactly. Pieces. But you'd be amazed how many people think, OK, it's got through my JSON schema. I can just use it blindly. It's a bit like all the type hinting folks in PHP who dive onto it go, because it's type hinted, the contents can't possibly be garbage because it's the correct type, and that's just nonsense. It just means you can access it without PHP crashing. That's literally all it means. So, so it doesn't replace your business logic. It just means that your business logic is a little bit more robust because it's not going to crash by accessing the wrong data type. That's pretty much all it means. And the fact that you can actually reject the whole thing and send it back to someone else without exercising your code if they've sent you garbage, which is always nice. So if you've got a slide in this, but uh, what would you reject that with? What kind of HTTP stays 400? Or? Um, the, if the JSON schema fails, I would probably go with a 400 rather than a 422. Would be for bit, would be the verification failure, the bit inspection failure. That's broadly speaking what I would do. But I've seen people re, um, have JSON schema validation return 422 as well. Um, so, I think it's difficult because with the because you're actually putting ranges on numbers rather than just saying it is a number. I think there's a I think I think there's an argument either way. If you didn't have those ranges in there, if it was simply just integers, objects, arrays, that sort of thing, I would definitely say 400 every time. But because you've got ranges in there as well, there's an argument to say 422 is also an acceptable response. Would you say you, you wouldn't mix and match though? How it fails. I would put it. The, I would put the validation in one place, which I'll t hopefully I've got a slide on that in a moment. I think I wrote one. We'll see. If not, I'll, I'll bring it up at the end. There's an RF. There's an RFC on a standardised response format for errors. Rob Allen wrote a blog post about it last November, something like that, um, to give you a standard response where you can actually explain why you've rejected it. And it's worth adopting that. I can't remember the RFC number off the top of my head, but yeah, go, go look it up. People do this all the time, but don't try and delegate your business logic into JSON schema is the point I'm trying to make in this section. Um, because you're trying to fit square pegs in round holes, and all that happens is you'll either end up being frustrated with JSON schema because it can't express what you're trying to, or worse, you'll let through data that you then allow to permeate through your system that you should be catching and rejecting because it fails your business logic. So be very careful with that. And of course, with GDPR, these things matter even more than ever. It's not just a security thing. We're talking about potentially trashing and poisoning personal data if you're not doing proper validation. So it's important to be professional on this. I want to finish off by talking about the benefits. 
just to finish. So I said before my pet hates about handwritten validation. Hopefully I've shown you that we've addressed both those points with JSON schema. That's what I'm hoping we've done. We mentioned about the reason I showed you compound schemas is you can build up your own internal dictionaries and reuse them, which is very handy to do. Please do it. And if any of you find existing schemas, uh, dictionaries for us to use, tell us if you start taking this stuff on. The other thing I found, remember, I'm not trying to retrofit this to an existing system. I've, so I'm, very, I'm well aware how very lucky I am in this. By designing an API and the schema side by side, JSON schema acts almost like a design constraint and stops you coming up with bonkers API designs. Because you go, I don't know how to write a schema for this. Probably helps you identify where existing ones are a bit mapped as well. It might do, but you may also find that you're starting to get into the areas of reuse and um, union types, for example, which aren't mature yet in JSON schema. So it can go both ways, I'd argue. But my argument is, if you're doing greenfield development at least, if it's hard to write a schema for, what's it going to be like for the poor person at the other end who's got to work with your API? It's probably going to be horrible for that person as well. So it's a bit like writing unit tests alongside code. It, you end up with better code. If you write documentation as you write your code, you, by just the fact of sitting down having to explain it, you go, oh, hang on a moment, why did I come up with that? Yeah, it's, it's that same mechanism. It's just another way of doing it. So I think it's very healthy. Content types. Instead of using application JSON on your API, use the application VND format. Are you, are you all familiar with that? OK, so it's a reserved type. And the idea is you, you start off with application VND and the plus symbol. Then after that, you put your own type information in. And what you can do, especially those of us who use any sort of um, like Express or does Symfony have middleware? Right. I, I, I mostly use Zen stuff, you see. Anything that's got any sort of pipeline, you just you, you do is you take your JSON schema um, stuff and put it as middleware in front of all your other code. So it fires on any API request coming in. It just oh, it, it, you use the schema name as your, as your content type. So you can automatically look up your schema, validate it, and reject it in one place. And it's one piece of code. Could you also do that with an accept header as well? Where would you have an accept header in this case? From the front end, when you're sending a request, that you're expecting a response back. Right. So if you use the accept header to say, I, I would accept back from you, know, JSON. Right. So HTML, for example. You could do. You can oh, accept. Oh, sorry, I thought you were saying accept. No, sorry. Accept. Sorry. Oh, accept. Accept. You could do. I don't see a reason not to. I'm willing to bet most apps never look at that header if it's sent. <laughs> yeah, you, I, I'm trying to think how you get it, you verify. Yeah, this has been bad there, but that's the I'm not interested. I've come across a couple of APIs that if you don't send an accept header, it gives you HTML back. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good point. So that's it. Those are the things I wish I'd known when I'd started out. I learned those the hard way. Um, what do you think? Does this seem like a viable alternative? Are any of you likely to? It's, it's something I think we're definitely looking at as, as an option for. So we've got our own CMS, mm. um, and uh, it is a bit unwieldy, but we deal with a lot of um, uh, oh, what did oh, Rich call it? The, the kind of, um, I'm going to have to cap it, um, the, the data structure, kind of sort of the, mm -hmm. yeah, that's the one. Yeah, that was it. Um, yeah, um, way of representing objects, mm. um, but there's no schema to it. Right. Um, and this would be a, a really good fit for that, I think. So I think our back end is, um, I think, mean, to be fair, really struggles with bad Lewis violation, just purely because A, it's, Kind of their and size is got to a point where it's like, okay, we'll just throw data in and see if it works. And that's totally wrong. We want to, I bet we're thinking on Jason's skill might actually be a thing to 
kind of stress yeah. we can't we, yeah. we we make changes we don't know what effect they're going to have whereas the validation is going to jump in at the first point and call and just reject it and that's yeah. going to help us all that'd be interesting to see how it goes with this big thing as well yeah you may find with an older project, um, especially as it sounds like it's grown organically, would that be a fair thing yeah, to say? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so you may find that you end up with a hybrid approach, yeah. but you have some existing structures that can't be expressed with JSON schema as is today, and you can't deprecate them and drop them either. Our, our first kind of protocol there is to split out a lot of it because it's quite monolithic. Yeah. Application, so it's start splitting it out, and then hopefully we can start doing these kind of things where we're doing like these validation and bits and pieces. Cool. Well, the thing, I, the thing I'd urge you is if you look back when the slides are online, some of those schemas were three lines long. You can get started with very, very simple schemas, even if you're still using 100% of your handwritten validation code as well. You don't have to switch one out because you're putting JSON schema in straight away. Well, you can build up your JSON schema and then start ripping it out that way. To me, it seems fairly similar, but less verbose in how much screen code it takes up to the XSL wisdom stuff you have to work with. Okay. Yeah, because that's essentially doing lots of rules. It's just got start tags and end tags all over the place. One thing I would say is Wisdom was meant to be a service description language. Um, this isn't. This is a data structure language. So there will be differences between the two that might matter to existing systems. Um, fortunately, I haven't used SOAP for many, many years. You are lucky. I am very <laughs> lucky. Um, can I ask, have you um, seen any projects interacting with this and GraphQL? Because we've adopted GraphQL recently, and although it's not doing the same thing, it gives you a lot of similar benefits in terms of a kind of strongly typed schema that can sit on top of your API. And I'm interested in whether you've come across any tooling that could take a JSON schema and help you bridge into a GraphQL schema from that. Not that I'm aware of. Um, I haven't come across many systems that support REST style APIs and GraphQL. Um, the GraphQL community, for someone on the outside looking in, the GraphQL community looks like a burn all rest from the outside. Maybe, but when you get into it, it's actually quite unique in that you can take um, you can take a bunch of REST APIs mm. and you can sit GraphQL on top, and it's quite opt-in, so you could just simply say, right, I want to pass this part of my scheme through to uh, GraphQL. Right. So it's not necessarily a replacement, it can augment um, a REST API with with that kind of strongly tight it, schema it, on top, which is interesting. It's not something I've seen. Um, the type of systems I work with, some of GraphQL's fundamental problems, the fact that everything's a post, so you've got no possibility of caching requests whatsoever, and they matter to my clients mm -hmm. and, their, and their particular use cases. So at the moment, I've no hands-on experience with GraphQL. I've only seen stuff as an observer. So I can't offer any... Uh, I've not seen any systems that may help you with that either way. Be interesting. <laughs> any more questions, please? Does anyone think, having seen it, that it's a load of junk and there has no place in their toolkit whatsoever? Because that's that's a, that's also valid. We we can't all use the same tools all the time. I think the only thing that is like so is, is the fact that it's still in draft. So I think that's the kind of really hesitant part yep. of this game. Oh, you know, like trying to you know, spend that effort to implement it. And then the drafts have changed. Like, yeah. so it might be a bit awful. But then, as you said, like, your experience has been in a spring change. So I'm like, what, what? My experience is that the core bits, the simple yeah. stuff, is stable. There's stuff to do with um, reuse via inheritance, some of the logic. I think the annotation keywords have changed as well, mm -hmm. but I don't really use those, so I'm not keep on top yeah, of those. It's, it's, it's all that... I was trying to find the right word. All this stuff that allows them to solve more and more problems for a wider audience, it's that stuff that is still churning. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, they don't put dates on their bloody release documents. 
and I don't think they were using GitHub at the time when they started releasing them, so you can't go through the GitHub releases, because I tried, to find out when all the releases were either. I'm pretty certain that's the case. So I don't know how long Draft 7's been out, but we've gone from Draft 4 to Draft 7 in about 18, 20 months. I can tell you that. Do you, do you find you're building your own internal company dictionary and then having client-specific sheets so it's easy for you to reuse your common definitions that you're going to have on yes. every end project? Yes, I do. Um, one of the things I haven't shown you is it does support union types, and a common union type is string or null. Be amazed how many API systems want to send a string through, or they want to say a field can be set to null, for example. So I have a, I have a, I have a little dictionary of those kind of things. Um, date time, um, to make sure that's properly expressed with, with the right regex, I've got that as well. And I think it's about a dozen things in there last time I looked. So presumably the, the composer package that you, you mentioned, I forget the name of it, uh, if you were to stick with draft 7, yeah. And that package moves on as long as you specify you're using draft seven scheme. It continue, should continue, continue to work. It's going to always support that moving forward. For now, I imagine when they get to one point zero, they may phase out draft support at that point. But I'm pretty certain uh, Justin Rainbow's uh, supports for draft four, draft draft six, and draft seven. AJV definitely does, but you do have to have an extra include statement to an import statement, sorry, to load in the support for the older drafts. It's all, all that's in the readme's. Cool. Well, I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap it up then. Okay. If you've got any more questions for Stu, um, please feel free to um, either uh, address them directly or drop a, a message onto our Slack channel and we'll pass the, the message on and, and help you um, get your answer from Stu. Um, thank you very much for, for coming. Thank you for having me back. <laughs>